This is ESG Decoded, the podcast powered by Global Affairs Associates to provide relevant, actionable updates related to business innovation and sustainability. Join Caitlin Allen and Amanda Shea of Global Affairs Associates for thoughtful, nuanced conversations with industry leaders that explore the complexities, the risks, and the opportunities connected to all things ESG. I'm Yvonne Harris, a consultant and co-host, and I will be collaborating with Caitlin and Amanda for the discussions that we will present on this podcast. Put simply, ESG is everything that is not on your balance sheet. This leaves room for misunderstanding, oversimplification, and the tendency towards one-size-fits-all perspectives. None of that will happen on this podcast. Enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm your host, Caitlin Allen, and this week I have Emmanuel Palakucha with me. She is the Senior Sustainability Advisor on the Special Projects Team at ISS Corporate Solutions. ISS Corporate Solutions is a wholly owned subsidiary of Institutional Shareholder Services. As a Sustainability Advisor on the ISS Corporate Solutions Team, Emmanuel works with corporate issuers across industries to develop their ESG strategies and improve sustainability-related disclosures and programs. She provides insight and guidance on alignment with ESG ratings, global frameworks, and standards, and is the lead materiality assessments advisor on the ICS team. Emmanuel holds an MS in sustainability management from American University's Kogod School of Business. Emmanuel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Happy to be here. Before we get into the conversation, for clarification, please tell us the difference between institutional shareholder services and ISS Corporate Solutions. So a lot of individuals and companies might be familiar with our parent company, ISS, which is a global proxy advisory firm and also creates and assesses companies around the ESG ratings that are available. ISS engages with institutional investors. We are a wholly owned subsidiary of ISS and our focus is on engaging with corporate issuers on best practice around ESG. We offer a range of support around governance and compensation solutions as well, and most recently, cybersecurity. We are firewalled off from ISS both technologically and physically and operate as an individual company. Okay, let's begin by talking about ratings in general. We're all familiar, at least in in our world, (laughs) with the MIT Aggregate Confusion Project, which showed that a company could be in the top 10% of one ranking and the bottom 20 of another. So with that in mind, let's talk generally, how do you think ratings fill a certain role and how may they fall short? It's a really great question and certainly something that a lot of clients I work with tend to struggle with is figuring out how to navigate the various ratings and signals that exist in the market. Ratings are very valuable to both companies and investors in a lot of ways. From the investor perspective, which is really one of the core purposes of those ratings, it allows for consistent and comparable information to assess companies across an industry or even across various industries on their performance related to ESG. So having that information available really enables investors to more effectively integrate ESG information into their investment processes since it pushes for increased transparency and disclosure around these various topics. From the corporate issuer perspective, it also provides guidance around what might be most important to focus on disclosing or improving in their ESG program. So understanding what type of information investors are looking for is reflected in the methodologies of various ratings and allows companies to identify areas where they might be lagging in their current programs and their current disclosures. So there's a lot of value in ratings in, in that sense, but of course, different providers of ratings employ different methodologies. And that's where the challenge comes in the discrepancies between various raters and how companies might score. 
different ratings might also serve different purposes. So I've mentioned disclosure and I've mentioned performance. Those can be two different signals. So for ISS, for example, there is an ENS quality score, as we call it, which is a rating that focuses on the level of transparency and disclosure for companies. But there's also the ISS ESG corporate rating, which focuses more specifically on sustainability performance. And so with the different purposes of these ratings, both within a rating provider and across ratings providers, there can certainly be differences in how companies score based on where their strengths in their programs may lie and where there might be more room for improvement. And I think one of the, the problems that we've seen is, at least from the working with corporate issuers, is that a lot of times it's hard to know really how you're truly being ranked, like what that methodology is. And I know that, I mean, I think it's very frustrating when you're working with different ratings and rankers and you don't know, well, you know, should I even be filling this one out or are they just going to be, you know, like, how do we really know if it's weighted? And, you know, I've worked with companies too that, you know, for example, there might be a particular issue that's just really not salient and not material for that company, but they get a, a lower score because they don't disclose anything on that. Well, if it's not important, right. Do you see that issue? So, so, you know, obviously you're working with ISS. I mean, does ISS do something differently? Um, or is it like you said, this, you know, just they each serve a purpose and the folks that are using that data kind of understand that? It's a great question. I think what I would highlight first is that oftentimes ratings are where investors begin. So taking a look at how companies score using that top level signal to better understand where a company currently is in their sustainability journey, as I often like to call it, um, is where investors can, can see at a quick look at a high level how companies are performing. Oftentimes, investors are digging deeper into that information. So investors will recognize that perhaps and, and a risk that one company is facing may differ very significantly from a risk that another company in that same industry is, is facing. And of course, there needs to be some consistency in the methodology of, of ratings to employ it at a, a larger scale. So rating companies across the same industry on the same indicators is often the, the methodology of these ratings. But of course, some particular topics might not be salient for, for a company. And so, you know, the way that we typically work with clients to uh, advise them on those challenges is twofold. First is, is based on just increasing transparency and messaging around why a particular topic might not be too salient for, for the company. So making it clear that to investors and to other stakeholders that it's, it's an issue that's been considered, um, but based on the nature of a company's operations, it's just not something that is particularly relevant. The other piece that we often advise companies on is to better understand what is material to their business. So using the ratings as a starting point, but then digging a little bit deeper to identify uh, what is actually salient to, to their business and their operations. This is reminding me a, a little bit of what, you know, we had Pavel Moltana from Raymond James on to get the investor perspective on this and investor perspective on, on this topic. And it's sort of similar to what he said in terms of it's, it's a quick signal, it's a quick look, but no one is making an investment decision based on a single sustainability score or an ISS score, right? That's just a, a, a starting point for research. You know, I think a lot of companies tend to get caught up in, well, what is our rating? Where do we rank among peers, et cetera? And that's important. But I think beyond that is, and, and you and I discussed this before we re started recording, there's deeper issues at play. And the most important thing in my opinion, that a company can do to 
do better in ratings and et cetera, is to really understand what are the underlying issues behind that question? What are the deeper things that they're trying to get at with that question? And I think once you start understanding those, then it becomes a much simpler to, to sort of understand how to answer or not answer or where you might fare among your peers. All of those things become a lot clearer when you understand the meaning behind the question or the reasoning behind the question. Why was it worded a certain way? Um, so, you know, I think on the whole, we're aligned on that, right? Is that it's, it's a good, it's a signal. Um, it's interesting, it's a starting point, but does the company look at deeply the issues that are being raised? I, I do agree completely. I think that really reflects going back to what we were speaking about earlier, what the value of these ratings can be for not just investors, but corporate issuers as well. If ESG ratings are treated as a check the box exercise where companies are just trying to put out information just for the sake of earning credit on a particular rating, it's not going to drive any value for the company or for the investor. Where the value comes from is, as you mentioned, better understanding the risks or the opportunities associated with various factors that are included within those ratings. For ISS specifically, the methodology of these various ratings is built based on investor feedback. That is the foundation on which the factors within the ratings are identified. As investor needs change and as their interests evolve, that is reflected in the methodologies of the ratings. So being able to understand that this information is, is what investors are really looking at and not just whether or not we're earning credit, but what information companies are actually disclosing, that is, is going to be tremendously valuable. So again, the, the benefit of these ratings and of increasing transparency and disclosure around ESG is to be able to demonstrate to investors and quite honestly, other stakeholders that the company is identifying relevant risks and opportunities around ESG and that it is implementing the right programs, the right policies, the right systems to effectively manage those risks or leverage those opportunities. And when ratings are approached more from, from that perspective and not just as a check the box exercise, uh, that really is where, again, there's value across the board for companies and investors alike. You brought up the, um scoring methodologies of different raters and rankers. We talked about, you know, some of them score more on transparency and others look more toward performance. How does ISS score transparency versus performance? So as I mentioned a bit earlier, there are various signals that ISS has created, once again, based on investor interest. So transparency and performance, when it comes down to it, can't necessarily be separated, but there certainly are different signals that focus a little bit more heavily on one versus another. So for one of ISS's ratings, the ENS quality score, there's a very heavy focus on the, the level of transparency, the level of disclosure. So ensuring that companies are putting out information on a particular topic that is relevant and significant for companies within their industry based on what investors value. Separate signals such as the ESG corporate rating go beyond that top level signal of disclosure to dig a little deeper and, and evaluate the actual nature of companies' programs, of their strategies, of their policies to ensure that they are checking, you know, or they are really up to the, the standard of, of best practice and that they, they are not just putting out a disclosure again to, to check the box, but that the nature of what they're disclosing is in line with, with best practice. There are, as I mentioned, many other signals 
that ISS has created based on investor interests. So for example, there is a dedicated climate related signal um, that looks at both disclosure and transparency, specifically in line with the TCFD recommendations or the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, but it also looks at current and future climate performance. So not just how is the company disclosing on climate, but how is the company actually performing on climate? How well prepared is the company to address climate related risks and opportunities? So, you know, as investor needs evolve and change, like I mentioned, the the ratings really evolve and change as well to best meet their demands. Thank you for that, Emmanuel. I think that's really helpful to see the you know, the the fact that these are not static either, right? The world is changing. (laughs) Companies are changing and evolving, uh, being forced to evolve quite quickly, and that the ratings and really do reflect that. But I want to bring up, there's a a very common criticism out there of a lot of these. um, And I wanted to give you a chance to respond to it. You know, very common criticism of the ISS model and others is that it's a racket. Right, you, you write the companies, then the other brands get paid to help increase scores. And ISIS is not unique in being criticized that way. How would you respond to that criticism? You know, we certainly appreciate that concern and understand why that concern exists. And we take it, you know, seriously in ter- terms of ensuring that it, it doesn't actually cause any conflict. So, ISS Corporate Solutions is fully firewalled off from ISS, both physically uh, and technologically. So the way we operate is separate from our parent company, from ISS. But when when it comes down to it in terms of that concern still of being connected to ISS as a wholly owned subsidiary, you know, our mission when it comes down to it is, is just to support companies on improving their ESG performance and disclosure in line with best practice. And that way we support companies through consulting really is is independent of just ISS ratings. We focus more broadly on on best practice. Okay, that's fair. I mean, I think that you know, broadly speaking, I would say the best practice is often does fall outside of what a rating or or system is looking at. And it makes me think a little bit about materiality assessment. I know that, you know, we get more requests nowadays from companies that they're just like, you know, I just want to do a SASB report, the sustainability accounting standards board, where that, that work on materiality has really been predefined in a way. I still believe that, it is incredibly valuable and far more valuable to do that materiality assessment of the specific business. And I'll just give you an example. The SASB standard for oil field services is is actually, you know, really several questions are are really just for onshore operators and they're really only for um, companies that do hydraulic fracturing. Well, there's hundreds, if not thousands of companies out there that are work in that industry that don't do hydraulic fracturing and don't work on shore. So I have found many times that those assessments are, you know, they're helpful. Like you said, it points you in a direction, but most companies aren't going to get as much value as if they do it themselves and really align their disclosures and their KPIs with issues that are truly material to that business. And I know that's something you work on. So you specifically work on the materiality assessment offering. Any thoughts for companies on that? Absolutely. I think SASB starting there, just because of your example, I think it's a great place to start, really takes a very specific approach to materiality. So the way that those indicators that companies are encouraged to disclose in line with are identified is based on a financial materiality approach. So SASB can go, goes through a, a very long research process of identifying what might be material to a traditional player in that industry. 
like you mentioned, that means it might not be applicable to every company in that industry. And that can be a challenge. There's also a very unique audience for SASB standards, which is providers of capital due to the fact that it looks at financial materiality. And this holds true for all standards and all ratings where the approach to materiality is defined in a certain way, the audience is defined in a certain way. You know, for example, GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, focuses on all stakeholders as the audience and materiality is defined so much more broadly just in terms of, you know, whatever makes sense for your business. And Mm -hmm. that's not always super helpful for companies either since there's so much information Mm -hmm. there. So you're right, they're phenomenal starting points. Those standards and those ratings are great to encourage consistency throughout the market, but ultimately, a materiality assessment really allows companies to identify what is most salient to their business, to their operations based on their unique stakeholders. So at ISS Corporate Solutions, our materiality assessment really takes a holistic approach to identifying what's material. We engage with a range of internal and external stakeholders to identify what is most significant and relevant to them in terms of the specific client that that we're working with. So that really allows companies to better identify where to allocate their their time, their resources, because they can have more confidence in the fact that what they're focusing on really is what their specific stakeholders are looking for and is applicable to them instead of being something that's applicable to you know, the broader industry. So that's certainly a a huge benefit of materiality assessments. Well, and I think it's, it's easy for, to forget too, that the instructions for SASB and GRI tell you, do your own materiality (laughs) assessment, right? So that's actually, you know, it's actually prescribed by most of these voluntary frameworks anyhow. Anyways, I think that's, it's an important topic. And at the same time, materiality assessment doesn't tell you everything, right? It tells you which topics are important, but, you know, that next step of, you know, well, which KPIs should we use for this? Should we use this ASB one? Should we use the one from GRI? Should we use a mix? And I don't know how you feel about this. I'm curious that w- I still prefer to do a custom mix that is truly reflective of that company's Um, business objectives and risks. But, you know, are you seeing any difference in the market? I mean, are are you starting to just say, okay, this aligns pretty well with SASB, let's focus on that? Or are you still prescribing a lot of custom reporting frameworks the way we are? It's, it's an interesting question, for sure. I think you're completely right. I, I agree that it's still a challenge to identify those KPIs once the materiality assessment has been completed. I think there are benefits to leveraging the existing KPIs and standards that are in place. Again, it allows for comparability across companies within a particular industry. It takes out some of the work for companies, which can't be underestimated when time and resources around sustainability might be limited. So mm-hmm. being able to leverage existing KPIs that have, have been established through SASB is certainly valuable. To your point, I think once you've done the work of the materiality assessment and you have more clarity around you know, what really is impactful for your business, then it allows you to more carefully choose those standards, uh, those KPIs through the standards rather that Mm -hmm. make sense for the company. You know, peer benchmarking and peer alignment is certainly something that we see a lot of our clients and a lot of companies focusing on. So understanding, yeah, yeah, which, which KPIs their competitors are using and making sure that there's alignment on that front. And so if all companies are sort of looking to align with their peers, then in a sense, it might make sense to look toward the standards that are in place since it allows for more consistency. But again, it it really has varied in my experience from company to company, from industry to industry, in terms of how they choose to approach 
choosing those those KPIs. Um, I don't think at this point in time, there really is a, a right or wrong way. I think all companies are navigating it in a slightly different way. Yeah, I, I actually totally agree. That sounds reflective of my experience as well. Um, it makes it made me think that just this week, you know, API, the American Petroleum Institute, just released guidance for their member companies on how to report things publicly. Now, of course, they, they've had guidance for years on how to actually do GSG accounting in the oil and gas industry. Um, but th this fills a bit of a gap that, they're, that they had in terms of every company, you know, maybe they're following the same guidelines internally for accounting, but weren't necessarily reporting the same information in the same way. And so I think there's a recognition among that industry as one example, and, but also among many other industries that the peer benchmarking and industry led guidance on this is actually plays a very important role in, in bringing some of that comparable data to, to the marketplace. But let me switch gears a little bit. Emmanuel, you started your career actually working at investor coalitions, which I think is so interesting. Some of the investor coalitions have been incredibly powerful. We know that Climate Action 100 Plus is, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn without having been involved directly, but from watching that development, I want to say they're almost single-handedly responsible for, for many of the changes that began, the announcements that began in December 2019 from Shell, for example, on scope three emissions, reviewing industry association memberships, et cetera. Um, so some incredibly powerful coalitions there. Tell us a little bit from your perspective, having worked at investor coalitions, why and how those investors use ratings and rankers generally? There are so many approaches that investors can take related to ESG. And, you know, we've spoken, we're focusing a lot on, on ESG ratings, which of course uh, I would say are, are a tool for the, in, the approaches that investors use to consider ESG. So like you mentioned earlier, Rater, or rather investors are not making investment decisions on ESG ratings alone. They are leveraging some of the underlying data to incorporate it into their unique investment processes. Uh, that is certainly something that they're doing. But beyond the sort of ESG integration approach, which is that process of building ESG criteria into investment decisions, Investors are also employing a lot of shareholder engagement in the way that they approach ESG. So that could include direct engagement with companies and speaking with them about better understanding their strategies for managing climate-related risk, for example. It could also come in the form of shareholder proposals and trying to push companies to take action on various ESG efforts through that mechanism that they have access to. So I think that, you know, the rating universe, the ESG ratings providers and these investor coalitions that engage actively with companies are very complementary of one another. I think that the work that they do really addresses various perspectives of how to motivate companies to take action on ESG. So again, the work that these investors are doing to actively engage with companies, ESG ratings can be used as a tool to, to point companies in a direction of how they can go about improving or using it as a, a messaging tool to say, you know, look at your scores. How, how can we improve your performance? There's a, a need to really drive improvements within your programs and within your disclosure um, based on, you know, where you currently stand in some of these ratings. So ultimately, I think that, again, they serve uh, fairly different purposes, but ones that, that work together really well to advance ESG programs throughout industries. And conversely, there might be an issue that a company's not disclosing on. For example, they have a really great water recycling initiative, but it's not 
on their website. It's not in their sustainability report. Maybe they don't have a sustainability report and an investor might see a rating that gives you a zero for water. And they ask that question, you know, it's, it's a conversation starter. Hey, what's going on with your water? Do you have a major issue <laughs> that you're not telling us? And the company can actually say, oh, you know what? We, we actually have a great program. We just don't have a sustainability report or we haven't disclosed any of it, but here's what we're doing, right? So it's not, I think in my experience as well, it's not that it's the be all and end all to get the score, right? Sometimes, like you said, they're used as an engagement tool, which might lead to a really great conversation actually in the IR department. I agree. I think it opens up the dialogue, sort of, like you said, it's a great conversation starter. And I think once again, the benefit of the ratings is to push companies to increase their disclosure on what they're doing so that current investors aren't the only ones who have access to that information, but it's available to a wider audience of stakeholders. We've spoken a lot about investors since that does tend to be the main user of ESG ratings, but as more stakeholders are focusing on sustainability, it's important for this information to be widely available for their use as well. A lot of, you know, consumers in for certain industries are considering this more heavily. So I think ratings are are a great motivator for better messaging around ESG as well. One other item that I wanted to highlight you know, my work with investor coalitions was very much with a a lot of socially responsible investors or SRIs that have been doing work around ESG or considering these issues for a long time in the work that they do. I think ESG ratings are also a way that more traditional institutional investors have begun to look at sustainability. So that is a tool for those investors to begin engaging with companies on ESG, while in the past it might have been more dedicated SRIs or activist investors that were doing a bulk of that work. And that, yeah, that definitely reflects the sort of mainstreaming of this into into the market more broadly. Okay, so let's end with our fun question, as always. Emmanuel, what was the last trip you took before the pandemic and what's the next trip you're going to take? Ooh, so before the pandemic, I tried to go to Berlin, Germany and took off. And as I was in the air, the travel ban was announced um, in March of 2020. (laughs) So I don't know if that counts, but I did make it to Europe and then turn around and come back hours later. So If that counts, that was my last trip (laughs) pre-COVID. To the Berlin airport. (laughs) Exactly. Beautiful airport. that's crazy. (laughs) It was definitely, if I remember. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely quite the experience. So hopefully my next trip will be a bit more successful. um, Taking a road trip down the coast of California, which should be really fun. And again, hopefully a little bit more successful. (laughs) Beautiful. Well, good luck getting to California. Hopefully there will be no more travel bans, but thank you so much for coming on to discuss this. It's been really great to have you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you for listening to ESG Decoded. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you consume yours and follow ESG Decoded and Global Affairs Associates across social media platforms. Until our next episode, take what you learned today to drive long-term value for your organization by doing good for people and for the planet.